Do you remember which problem that was? With section it was from? It was 2.4, I believe. Like, like okay, 2.4. Okay. Um, so today we are actually just going to cover the review. So I am going to go into WebAssign, but before I do, there was a problem I wanted to mention. Maybe it was 2.3. I think it was quadratic, yeah. It did vertex and all that in there. I think it was a football. Here we go. There it is. Okay. So number 17 was the one that talked about a football being hunted. That's like chicks, right? <laughs> so how much football. Um, okay, so the first question says, how high is the, mm. the ball when it is hunted? So you're basically looking for the maximum height. But in order for you to find that maximum height, um, you actually need to know the horizontal distance. Okay, so there's two things that are happening. The ball is going forward, but it's also going up and then back down again, right? And so it creates that parabola shape as it goes forward, up, and down at the same time. When it does that, you're going to first find out uh, how high the ball is. So how high the ball is is going to be its y value at the vertex. So you do have to do the vertex formula, the negative b over 2a stuff. The negative b over 2a helps you figure out the x value. So, and for part a, they're asking you how high the ball is. So then that means they want to know what that y value is. So once you figure out the x value, you plug it into the function and you'll get that answer for part A. Okay. For part B, it says what is the maximum height of the ball? Oh, that doesn't make any damn sense. That's asking the same question to me. How high is the ball when it is planted? What is the maximum height of the plant? Oh no. <clears throat> A is not how high the ball is the maximum. It just wants to know how high is the ball when it's first Kicked. Okay. And so normally with the punters, they hold the ball, right? And then they kick it. So when they're holding it, they want to know how high it was before they actually started kicking it. Okay. And so in that case, no time or no distance would have happened from that point, right? So you literally are just plugging in zero for part A. And if I plug in zero here and zero here, don't you just get 1.5? Right. So about a foot and a half is how high the ball was before it got kicked. Okay, then it wants to know the maximum height. That's the one. Anything that says maximum or minimum, it's talking about your vertex. Okay, so go find the x value of the vertex, then plug that x value in, and you'll be able to tell me what the maximum height is. Okay, the last one was a little bit different. The last one wanted to know how long the punt was. Okay, so it's not asking you for height, it's asking you for the distance, right? So it is asking you for an x value. But if it wants to know how long it is, it's basically from where it started until it lands on the ground, right? That will tell you how far the ball has gone. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this whole function and you're gonna set it equal to zero on the left-hand side. And when you solve that, hopefully you're using quadratic formula, but when you solve that uh, equation, that's going to give you the answer for part C. You will most likely end up with two answers with the quadratic formula. One of them will be most likely negative, and then the other one positive. So you, negative one is not going to be your answer, right? No such thing as a negative distance. So you're going to be using that positive result when we do that quadratic formula. Okay. We may have one of those today. Um, we probably do have a maximum and minimum problem. I just don't know if we'll have one where we have to set it equal to zero. Okay. So today we really want to concentrate on this review. I don't remember how many problems are on here. I hope it doesn't take the whole hour and 45 minutes or probably an hour and 30 minutes now. Um, seeing there's a lot of ones, but they're not all lengthy, right? They don't all take a whole bunch of time to figure out, okay? For instance, these are saying determine whether the relation represents y as a function. So remember what you're trying to look for, the shortcut way. I mean, I can put the definition in the test, but the shortcut way to look at it is to look at all the inputs, all the x values. And if you see any of those x values repeat, 
If they have the same y value, they're okay. But if the x values repeat and they have different y values, then that's not okay. That means it's not a function. Okay. So in this case, we do have an x value that does repeat. You have two of them actually, right? We have 13 that repeats and we have eight that repeats. However, the 13s have two different y values and the eights have two different y values. So this one's like double wrong, right? Or double bad, <laughs> not wrong. But this one is not a function, okay? If you look at number two, it's the same kind of question, but none of these x values are repeating, are they? So that automatically makes it a function, okay? Then here it wants to know just for us to find the function value. And so there might be something a little bit that you could write on your paper, but not a whole lot, okay? So I'm going to write down number three on my paper. And then we're going to talk that one out. It can be done pretty quick. Um, this is not one of the problems where I have a comment on the test. I'm not going to open the test, otherwise I give you all the problems. But um, in the problems, there are 16 problems on this test. Okay, And so each one's going to be worth like 6.25 points. And the way I put it in the rubric was that one point is still whether you clicked on the right answer or not, right? Or on the test, whether you selected the right answer in the paper. Then the second point is whether you're actually it's 1.25 points for the notation. Okay, so are you writing things correctly? Are you writing like this equals this equals this equals this, right? Or do you have a bunch of chicken scratch all over your paper? Okay, make sure you're writing it so that it flows your solution. Okay, that's your notation. And then the other four points come uh, from your work, whether or not you're showing your steps or all your steps correct. Did you make a arithmetic error? Did you make a conceptual error? That sort of thing, right? That's how you get however many of those four points on your scoreboard. But there's like a few problems, especially like those first two, where you don't really need to write anything down, right? You're just looking at it and then you're, you're using what you know about functions to decide which is the right answer. For those particular problems, I do have extra instructions on the side that says, you do not need to show work for this problem. If you mark, if you select the correct answer, you get all 6.25 points. If you do not select the correct answer, you get zero points, okay? So that one is not one that I'll give you like partial credit on. It's either you got it or you didn't, okay? I believe out of all 16, there were like probably four or five of those kinds of problems on there, okay? So there's really only about 10, maybe 11 that you have to actually uh, work out, okay? So if you don't see it say, don't, no work is needed, then you need to show something, okay? And if a problem like number three were on the test, um, it would not say no work is needed, okay? Because yes, I can look at that and decide which function to use, but I do wanna see how you're getting the actual values, okay? And so you do need to show me what you're plugging these numbers into. And I promise you, I have had people do this in the past and I'm letting everyone know now while this thing is being recorded. Do not plug these numbers into both of the functions. Don't do that. If you do that on your paper, you will get no points for that particular problem or that part, okay? You cannot plug it into here and here. You need to know which one of those functions you're supposed to be plugging negative four in, okay? And only plug it in the one you're supposed to be plugging it into. So let's recall, this is what kind of value, an X value or a Y value? When it's in those little parentheses, it's what? X. It's X, just like up here, right? Don't they have an F and then they have an X inside the parentheses? So if you see an F and then a number in there, you know that that's an X value, okay? And so that's gonna clue you in as to which section you're gonna use because we need to know where that X value lives. Okay, so is this x value negative four less than negative one or greater than or equal to negative one? It's less than negative one. So I should only be plugging in negative four into that function, okay? So I'm gonna go over to my paper real quick and then just show you what you would be writing on your paper, okay? 
it's not a whole lot. It's just, and I have people writing down the questions. You do not ever need to write down the questions. I can see the questions. You're just wasting time writing down the questions. Okay. So I already have all of this on the computer, right? Or on the paper. You don't need to rewrite it down. But what I do need you to do is these things. So we already decided that we're going to plug this negative four in there. So I'm going to say negative three, negative four, minus three. Now, whether you do all of the computations or not, that's completely up to you. Or you can just write the actual answer. I believe it's nine. I want to double check me because I almost said negative 15. <laughs> right, negative three times negative four would be what? Positive 12, and then we take away three to get the nine, right? Okay, I need to see this step that that's where the nine came from. Okay, don't just say this equals nine and then you're done. I need to see how you got that nine. So just show me that you're putting it in and what you're putting it into, and you're good. Okay, for this one, which Function should I be plugging it into the bot the top one or the bottom one? Why the bottom one? Right, that one says I can equal negative one, right? So then on your paper, you're just gonna put negative one into that bottom function. And again, you don't have to show all the steps. You can type that whole thing in your calculator if you wanted to. But I think you end up with negative two. One, because this is a positive one, right? Well, this guy and this guy just like each other out. And then two times a negative one is minus two. Okay. And then for C, where does that one live? Does it live on the top or does it live at the bottom? It is bottom. Who said bottom? Nobody said bottom. Quiet. Okay. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Why does it go in the bottom one? Mm -hmm. Positive one is bigger than negative one, isn't it? Right? So it does go at the bottom. So you just plug it in there. And then this one, I actually get four. Oh no, we don't get positive two. Because they have the same situation happening. Go like this positive one and that minus one cancel each other. But now this is a positive two. Okay, let's go back and see what else they got for us. Okay, so like this one, again, this is something that number four is something you don't need to write anything for, right? You should be able to look at that and know what the domain is. Number five and number, well, number five will not say no work for me because you might need to do something on number five, okay? So it's kind of even a hint in itself. So you see one that says for the domain, and there's, it says no work needed. And then there's another one that has domain, and it says nothing. You know you've got to show something. So for this one, what kind of function is this? Quadratic. And quadratics are just a special kind of polynomial. All polynomials, though, have what kind of domain? All real numbers. So it should be that one. No matter what kind of polynomial this is. As long as there's no radicals, and more importantly, no even radicals, okay? If there's no even radicals, and if there's no x's downstairs in the fraction, then your domain will always be all the numbers, okay? For number five, though, it does have an even fraction, an even radical. What kind of radical is that? Number five. It's a square root, which means the little index there is an invisible two, right? And two is even. So for even radicals, we actually have something that we have to do. We have to take that inside stuff and set it to what? Right, you have to set the inside greater than or equal to zero. And then you solve it. So once I take that inside junk and I set it greater than or equal to zero, I just minus five on both sides and I get this. Now they chose to write it in words. So we need to find the response in there that matches what I have in symbols, okay? 
So this says y is greater than or equal to negative five. Basically, numbers that are greater than or equal to negative five, right? Oh, they do have it. Nice little inequalities. That's awesome. That's the one that matches mine, isn't it? So I'm just going to select that one. What about number six? Is that one an even radical? Yes. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> no. What kind of index does this one have? It has a three index. It's right there, right? This one's not even invisible. It's right there for us. But three is not an even number. So this is an odd radical. And odd radicals don't have any kind of restriction on their domain. Their domain are just all real numbers. Okay. Remember, you're only looking for even radicals and x's in the bottom of a fraction. Now for number seven, do I have any even radicals? In number seven, this one here. Even radicals? There's no radicals, right? But does it have x's in the fraction, the bottom? Yes. It does. And so when we have that, we have to do what with the bottom? Correct. More importantly, set it not equal to zero because your x cannot equal that factor. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that that denominator cannot equal zero. It just cannot, right? Otherwise, it makes the whole thing wacky. It's not a number. It's undefined. Now this, you actually, when it's a quadratic, you could do quadratic formula. Your C is missing, which means it would be zero. Okay, so you could do quadratic formula. For me, factoring is going to be the easiest way to solve this because I can factor out an X. And then I have this, right? And then I could set this factor equal to or not equal to zero, and this factor not equal to zero. And so then I get x cannot equal zero and x cannot equal eight. Okay. Again, you could have also done quadratic formula. Your a would have been one, your b would have been a negative eight, and then your c is missing, so it would have been zero. You could have done quadratic formula. Just in case factoring doesn't come to you or you're just not going to want to bother. You could have done the quadratic formula. You'll get the same two numbers. Okay. So I'm going to say which one of those is the same thing as saying x cannot be zero and x cannot be eight. All real numbers except that guy and that guy, right? That's the same thing as saying that x can't equal x or zero or eight. Oh gosh, great. <laughs> Definitely got to show something on this one. Okay, so we've got two issues here, right? You definitely have an even radical because that's just the regular square root. And we have an x in the downstairs, right? So we have two things we're going to have to do then. So we definitely need to take the x plus seven that's in the numerator and set it greater than or equal to zero. But we also need to take the denominator and say that that cannot equal zero, right? Okay. So when I solve these two things, I get x is greater than or equal to negative seven, and I get x cannot equal negative seven. How do I put these two statements together into one statement? Get rid of the bar. So it's just going to be greater than negative seven because it can't equal and not equal at the same time, right? This one is going to throw that equal bar out, okay? And so then this is what your domain will look like. Anything that's bigger than negative seven. Do I have anything like that? I do. This one right here is just like that. X has to be bigger than negative seven. Okay. Number nine is a little bit different. Number nine has the radical and the variable in the denominator, right? Everything's all up in the denominator. So for that one, you do have two statements to say, but you can put them together. So for number, it's not number eight, it's number nine, right? 
you do have to say that the radical cannot equal zero because your denominator cannot equal zero, right? But then you also have to take the inside and set it greater than or equal to zero because of the radical. But these two statements, we've already kind of put something together like this. Actually, before I do that, this is just X. Is this one just X? No, right? How do I get rid of that little square root? So square. Mm -hmm. And then I have to square this side as well, right? So over here on the left-hand side, I get X. And on the right-hand side, zero squared is still zero. Now that this is just X and that is just X, now I can put those two statements together. So remember, it should be greater than or equal, but this guy takes the bar out, doesn't it? So it should just be X is greater than zero. Some people don't do these three, don't do this part. They just say the inside has to be greater than or equal to zero, and then they say, oh, but it can't be zero downstairs, so they just take away the bar, okay? Regardless of how you're doing that one, this one should be more than me. And if you are doing this by itself, just tell me, because you don't want to write this and that's just the answer and not have nothing else, because then I'm going to say, well, you didn't show the work for you to explain your answer, okay? So if you do just say it's this, just put on the side um, something like because or since, I think that's what the book uses the last time since because um, the inside of the radical must be greater than or equal to zero, but the denominator is not be zero. Okay. What happens to the uh, negative h? Do we just talk about it? This x minus h? No, don't matter. It doesn't matter what's in the numerator. The radicals are the problems and the denominators are the problems. Okay. So it does not matter what's going on in the top. As long as there's no radical in the top. Because number eight had a radical in the top, right? And that was the problem child up there. This one doesn't have any problem child children up in the numerator. Okay. Okay. A good question. Okay, we've got one more, number 10. So this one, again, I'm going to do it the shortcut way, and I'm just going to show you what I'm going to write on the side. So over here on this one, again, you don't have any issues with your numerator. There's no radicals in your numerator, right? But the denominator is a problem. And I know that the X minus nine has to be greater than or equal to zero, but because it's downstairs, can it actually equal zero? No. So you can just put this and then put radical greater than or equal to zero, but denominator cannot equal zero. Literally, that's the same thing minus a paragraph, right? Okay. So you can get shorthand with it. <laughs> say the same thing without having to write so much, right? And then if I solve this guy, I'm just going to add 9 over, and I get that x has to be bigger than 9. Yeah. Okay, and then here I get this one right there. Okay, now I noticed that the computer, there seems to be a problem with This book and the rest of the world. <laughs> um, this book, I'm going to go over to the paper. Okay. This is called, if I were to take a function, I'm just going to cover it. Okay. In the regular world, if you have a function that looks like this, this is considered the general form okay, of a quadratic. This one, in the book, is called standard form. But the rest of the world calls it the vertex form. 
And I'm bringing that up because they use those words interchangeably. Okay, sometimes they'll say standard form and then sometimes they'll say that a vertex form. And I also want to bring it to your attention because if the problem does say standard form, and in my formulas, I have this labeled as the vertex form, right? You need to know that those are the same thing, okay? So if you have a note sheet and it says vertex form, and the problem is asking you for standard form, you have to know that those are the same thing, okay? So standard form and vertex form are the same thing. Okay? So what I'm looking for is I'm trying to get that problem to look like this, right? So let me write down what the problem was and then we'll try to get it like that. So bear with me, I'm gonna go back over there real quick. Um, G of X equals X squared minus eight X. Now you could go and complete the square and all that jazz, but I'm gonna not do that just because I know how to get H and K and it's not too difficult to figure out H and K. And do we already know what A is? What is A? A is equal to one. So that one's not too hard either. I do still need to figure out what H is and I need to figure out what K is. Once I know what these three numbers are, I can write this vertex form or this standard form. Okay. So for H, we know that we get that from doing negative B over 2A. And so what is B in this case? You already told me that A is one. What is it? Eight, negative eight. eight. Negative eight. You got it. So then I get positive eight over two, which is actually four. So now I know that H is four. If I want to figure out K, I just have to plug the H value into the function. Well, it's not an F here, right? But G. So I'm going to have to find G of four of X. So I'm going to say four squared minus eight times four. That is 16 minus 12, which is coincidentally another four. Right, 16 minus 12? Oh, yeah. No, yes. 16 minus 32, right? <laughs> I'm thinking the what I'm thinking. So what'd you get? There you go, that's it. And so now I know that K is negative 16. So once you have those three numbers, I'm literally going to plug them in exactly like they are into this problem. So I'm going to put parentheses x minus close that square and plus. And I'm literally going to plug in the a, the h, and the k exactly as they are. Okay. So the a was one, the h was a positive four, and the k was a negative sixteen. And then you just clean it up. So if you have a one as a coefficient, do we really ever write that one? No. So it's just X minus four squared. And when you have double signs like that, you have to multiply the signs together to get one sign. So what should it be? Plus 16 or minus 16? Minus, minus. When you multiply a positive and negative, you just get a negative, right? And this is what you'll see in the choices, okay? Oops, I kept using F. Wrong name, right? Nobody's talking about Frank today. I'm talking about Terry. Okay. Well, let's go see here. You would type all that in there. So parentheses x minus four. Raise it to the two. Get down minus sixteen. And then for you to graph it, it has to have that HK point, okay? So we'll go back to my paper real quick. Notice that the values I have are four and negative 16. So I'm gonna look for the graph that has the point at four and negative 16. Here's four, but that's positive 16, isn't it? And then this is negative four, not the right kind of four. Here we have negative four and negative 16. Again, I'm supposed to have positive four and negative 16, so it's probably this graph, right? Um, and then the vertex, we already figured that out. It was four and negative 16. The axis of symmetry is an equation. Always write x equals. And then it should equal wherever you have the beach. 
Okay, so it should be x equals four. The x intercepts, we did not calculate those, and I cannot really tell from the graph what those are. So that is something that I have gonna have to show on my paper. Okay. Remember how you find x-intercepts? You make the y equal to zero, and then you can figure out what those x values are. So I'm going to come over here, and for that other part, I'm going to make the y value, this whole thing is a fancy y value, I want to make this whole thing zero, and then solve. So I'm going to do zero equals x squared minus 8x, and this is to find the x-intercepts. So again, this is just like the problem we had earlier. here, so I'm gonna factor it. You can do quadratic formula, I'm just not gonna do that. And then if I add eight, I get these two values, okay? So it wanted the x-intercepts and points. So this one is, has an x value of zero, and what was the y value that I plugged in? Zero. And then here, x is eight, but still the y value that I had plugged in was zero. Now, which one of these has the smaller x value? So this one would be the smaller x value, and then this one would be the larger x value. Just because the computer does want them in that specific order, right? So here it would be zero comma zero, but here it would be eight comma zero. I don't need the parentheses because they already have them there. Be careful because a lot of times we get getting messages of why are they telling you wrong? I know it's right, and it's because of something so like that. Okay, this one's another one, just like number eleven, but it has the C, right? The other one was missing the C. And this one actually has it. Mm -hmm. What you do is not going to change at all. The process is still the same, the numbers are different. Okay. So I'm still going to be trying to find the A, the H, and the K. Do you know what the A is just by looking at it though? It's this guy, right? One. The H, the one we have to actually work for a little bit, we have to do negative B over 2A. So in this case, that's negative of a positive 4 and 2 times positive 1. So in the end, I end up with negative 2 for H. And how do we find K? Plug it in. So we're going to plug that number into our function. So we get negative 2 squared plus 4 times negative 2 plus 4. Um, I need 0. Can you get 0? Okay, good. Okay. So then what is going to be the vertex form? It's going to be g of x equals a times x minus h. You don't have to put the parentheses, I just did it naturally. So there's a minus from the vertex form, and then you're plugging in a negative 2 for h. So don't forget that this is from the formula, and this is the value you have. Okay? Plus the k is 0. And so I kind of clean this up. One does not need to be there. But well, what's a negative and a negative? So it should be plus two instead. And you don't have to write plus zero either. So this is the standard form. Standard or vertex, whichever words they're using. Then it's going to ask you for the graph, right? We know that this graph should be located from here, negative 2, 0. So negative 2, 0 is right there. And the parabola should be opening upward or downward? 
Yeah, because this is positive, right? When this is positive, it goes up. Okay, and then what's the vertex? Always h comma k. So for me, that is what comma what? Negative two and zero. Good. And then the axes of symmetry. What is that going to be? Right. It's an equation. X equals negative two. Good. And then if it asks me for the x intercepts, what is that? There's only one. What is it? Negative two, zero. It's already there, right? We already know what it is. I want to see if they ask you for that y intercept, though. Let me go see what the computer said. So we know this that's x plus 2. We know what the graph looks like. It looks like this one over here. Oh, it doesn't ask you for that. So good. Axis of symmetry is x equals negative two. And then we already know the x-intercept is the same thing as the vertex. Okay. Now number 13. Number 13 says write in standard form of a quadratic function whose graph is the parabola with a given vertex and passes through the given point. Now remember, in order for me to write a function, a quadratic function in standard form, I have to know three things. I have to know the a, the h, and the k. Because they have given me the vertex, I do know what the h and the k are. But I cannot tell you what the a is right now, okay? What I can tell you is that you're going to use this point to find that A, okay? So let me go over to my paper. Let me write it down first. Vertex is one and negative two. And then you have another point, negative one and four. Uh, so I want the A, the H and the K. And right now I do know the H and the K. So I'm going to plug that in. H is one and the K is negative two. Instead of writing plus negative two, what can I write as this? Uh, but if I want to figure out the A, we need to use this point, okay? And in order for me to use that point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this one X and this one a Y, right? Isn't this a fancy way of saying Y? So I'm going to plug in those numbers. This weird A is going to become 14, and the X is going to become negative 1. And now the only variable in the problem is that A. So I should be able to solve for that a. First, let's figure out what its coefficient is. So I have negative two squared, which means I have a positive four there. So really, four a minus two equal to that 14. How do I solve that? Not the one yet. No? Uh huh. I'm going to get this by itself first, right? Before you can get the A completely by itself. So, yes, add your little two. You'll get 16. And then we can divide by the four. And so then we get four will equal A. Now I have all three of the numbers that I need to tell you the answer, right? So f of x equals the 4 for a that I just found, the 1 for h, which is right here, this guy's h, this guy's k. And then instead of plus and negative 2, I'm just going to write minus 2. Okay. But 
this is the answer. But you had to do a lot of work to get that A, right? You with the H and the K were just had to get that A. Once you have that A, you just you could have also just erased this and put a four, right? Okay, I think number 14 is different, but it still has to do with all of this quadratic stuff. Now here, I don't know. I want you to write f of x in there or not. Oops. I'm just going to write 4 x. It does say function, so maybe it does look like that. I don't know, we'll try it. On the test, it's not that complicated because you have choices, right? Well, you have to sit here and figure out what you're supposed to be typing in there. Yeah, things like that. We'll see. Okay, number 14 is a little different. It says the profit P in hundreds of dollars that a company makes depends on the amount X in hundreds of dollars the company spends on advertising according to the model, and then it has your quadratic function there. What expenditure for advising advertising yields a maximum profit? So they are asking for maximum. Every time you see the word maximum or minimum, what should you be looking for? Vertex. Then you just have to decide well, which part of the vertex do they want? Do they want the, in this case, it's X, or instead of Y, in this case, it's P, right? So do they want the X value or do they want the P value? It does say what expenditure for advertising yields this maximum. Who is that? Y is the profits, right? The P is the profit. The X is how much they spend on advertising, isn't it? So all they're wanting to know is what the X value is of that vertex, okay? And it's not very hard to find the x value of the vertex. It's just the negative e over 2a. So let me write the problem down. p equals, but there is a little trick in here. Because if you leave the function looking like that, you might get the wrong a and b. E. This is backwards from the regular general form, right? You have to remember that A is a coefficient of X squared. So is this A? No, that is not the coefficient of X squared. What is the coefficient of X squared? Almost negative 0.5, right? Is it negative? And then B, you have to remember, is the coefficient of X, just the regular X. And so who is B in this problem? Probably 50, got it, okay. So when you go to find that X value of the vertex, you're just doing negative of 50 over two times negative 0 0.5. You actually end up with negative 50 over negative one, which is 50. Pay attention because sometimes the choices will have 50, and then another choice might be 5,000. And it's 5,000. Because notice what it says here it says it wants to know how many dollars, right? But X represents the money in hundreds of dollars, doesn't it? So if it's hundreds of dollars, then what I have to do is I have to take this 50 and multiply it by 100 dollars right and that's where you get the five thousand dollars from okay. so pay attention if it said thousands of dollars then you'd be multiplying by a thousand okay if it said tens of dollars sounds weird but if it said that you just multiply by ten okay Number 15, this one says, this one is completely visual. I'm not even gonna write on my paper. 
if you have one like this on a test, it is not going to ask you to show anything. There's nothing to show. Literally just look at it and then answer it. Okay. So if you look at this one, what is the domain? We have to remember what domain is. It's where the x values start and where the x values stop. Okay. So you're basically taking like a whole graph and then transposing every single point onto the x-axis. So it's like I'm taking this point and putting it right there onto the x-axis, and then every little one of these microscopic points are going up to the x-axis as well. Okay, everything, all of them, all of them, all of them, until you get to this one that drags down to there, right? When you're done transposing the whole graph onto the x-axis, where does that shaded part start and stop? What x value will it start at over here on the left? And then where will it stop? At the positive two. And then you just have to decide whether or not it's supposed to have the parentheses or the brackets. Okay. So the one on the left should have what kind of symbol? Correct. Correct. Because it's an open dot, right? And then what kind of symbol should I have on the right? Bracket. Because that one has a closed dot. Now the range is the same sort of thing. You're still transposing everything onto an axis. It's just not the x axis anymore. Now it's the y axis. Okay. So all of these points are smashing onto the y axis. Okay. And it's just like they're coming from both sides, smashing onto the y axis, right? There's not a problem. Everything is solid all down here, right? So when this guy comes over here, when that guy comes over here, they're both going to be solid spots right all solid what's really weird is up here because when this spot moves over there it's an open dot right but then when this dot moves over there what happens it fills it in right closes up the hole so then it's actually solid right there okay so it's solid down here these things are a bunch of little tiny microscopic solid solid dots so it's solid down here and it will be solid up there. So what will be the range that I write in here? Yes, and another bracket, yes. Good, good, good. Like I visualize it being smushed onto the way I and smushed onto some people actually like draw it <laughs> and then write with it again. I think when I was teaching it, I drew it and shaded it in and then we just put the apple. Okay, this one's weird. It says f of negative one. So remember, if it's in the parentheses with the f, they're giving you the x value. And what they're asking you is for the fancy y value, okay? So you go to the graph and you find where x is negative one, and then you either go look up for the graph or you look downward for the graph, but stay on that line where x is equal to negative one, okay? And I noticed that I touched the graph right there. So what is that y value right here? Then for f of zero, now the x value is zero. There's no graph up there, but I do have a graph right here. What is that y value? Negative four. And then here I'm looking at the x value of positive one. There's no graph up here, but I do run into the graph right there. What is that y value? Negative five again. And then now two, positive two. So that's here. There is a graph up there, right? What is that one value? Positive four. That okay. So look for the x value, stay on that x value little invisible line, right? Go up to look for the graph, go down to look for the graph. Wherever you find the graph, look at the y value. Okay. Now, this one says to use the vertical line test to determine whether or not it's a function. Remember, vertical line test is you imagine a bunch of vertical lines, and if even just one vertical line, just one of those imaginary vertical lines, touches the graph two times or more, it is already not a function. Every single vertical line can only touch the graph one time or no times. Okay? So this one would be a no because. If I draw them anywhere over here on the right, they all cross the graph twice, don't they? Okay. 
However, this one, I could draw a bunch of lines on the left and they only ever touch the graph once because this is slanted. It's not perfect, okay? Same thing here, this is slanted. So if I draw a bunch of vertical lines, every single one only touches the graph once. I do have a vertical line in the middle that never touches the graph, right? But that's okay. I can never touch it or I can touch it one time, but I can't do it two more, more times, okay? So this one is a function. <clears throat> this one says that weird word that I don't like. <laughs> it says find the zeros of the function. Okay, this one I am going to write down. Those vertical line tests, there are some on the test. There is no work that you need to show. You just apply the test and then you say yes or no. Okay. So those will be one of the ones where you're either going to get all the 6.25 points or you're going to get another one. You do know the vertical line test in that. So for number 18, it does ask me for quote unquote zeros. And I mentioned a long time ago, right? It seems like a long time ago, what that word means. We know that this word zeros means x intercepts. Okay. And that's nothing new. We know how to find x intercepts. You just make this weird fancy y value equal to zero. As soon as you have it equal to zero, you can solve for x to find the x intercepts. Now, this one I personally would factor it. And I noticed that I can factor out an x squared and so I end up with this and it's almost like a difference of squares because those are two perfect squares but I'm just going to rewrite it with a positive 9 in the front and the minus 25 x squared in the back because then now that looks more like a difference of two squares right? whereas before I had a plus in the middle so it didn't look like once I know that, I can factor the difference of squares pretty easy. What number times itself gives me nine? Three. So this will be three times three, that would give me the nine, right? Then what times itself will give me 25 x squared? Almost, five times five will only give me 25. How will I get 25 x squared? Square one would have to be Yes, you're getting there. I'm not there yet, but yes. So 5x times 5x is 25x squared, right? But you're right. One of them has to be negative, and then the other one has Once it's all factored, you're just setting each one of those factors equal to zero. So here, I can take the little square root. And there's really no such thing as plus or minus zero, is there? Just zero. Not two x's, it's just one, right? Over here, though, I have the minus three over. And the same for the other equation. I'm going to have the minus that three over. But on this side, I'm still left with a negative five x. And on this side, I'm left with a positive five x. So when I go to divide, on this equation, I divide by negative. But on this equation, I divide by positive. So I'm going to end up with the positive because the negative and the negative is positive, right? And over here, I'm going to end up with the negative. So I actually get three zeros. Okay, I get zero, positive three fifths, and negative three fifths. Those are my zeros. This whole thing, these polynomials will get bigger and it will get more challenging on how to find these x intercepts in another chapter. Okay. But this process is going to come back to us in a different chapter. Okay. So they kind of like slowly introduced it to us with the quadratics. Now they're getting a little bit higher in the exponents. We will get even higher in the exponents. And if not higher, then a lot more terms that you can't factor. Okay. It's not an easy way to factor. It'll be fine, I promise. <laughs> I should have promised that, right? <laughs> He's like, don't promise that. <laughs> so 
So I would just put in my three thingamabobs here, three over five, comma, negative three over five. Okay, now what do they want? This is another one that is very visual. There's nothing to write down here. Okay, look at it and then just select the answer. For us, you have to look at it, type in the answer. Does this graph ever increase? It does. Now remember, when you're reading the graph, you have to go from left to right. So if I start over here, what is it doing right now? Decreasing. But then once I reach this little valley, what does it start to do? Increase. Is it ever constant? No. No. So for that one, I think they want us to enter D and E. Okay. But for the increasing, it's the right-hand side, right? Now we have to remember that we need to use open intervals, which means I'm going to use parentheses. I have to, okay? The same thing for the decreasing. I have to use parentheses. But what's gonna go inside for the increasing? It starts where and stops where, or does it stop? What would be that interval? I can only put one number in my interval. So where does it start? Does it start at five or does it start at negative 25? So remember something. I wrote it in my paper when we were doing this section, but I noticed that they did not say it. But it always wants you to determine the open intervals of the domain, which means you're only supposed to be putting in X's in there. Okay, so then do we ever need that negative 25? No. It's just going to be from five to what? Infinity, because it goes forever, right? That one I don't think I have enough to put it Then now the decreasing was the left side. So how do I write the left side as an interval? Negative infinity to what? So five. Exactly. So remember, for increasing, decreasing constants, two things to remember. Only put x values in the interval and only use parentheses. Okay, gotta remember those two things. <coughs> what does it want? Oh, it's another one where it just, I mean, they gave us the function. If you're scared of this function, it looks scary, right? But it's not. Just look at the picture, okay? Does this one ever increase? I see three sections. So to me, my brain is like left, middle, and right. Okay. Which one of those sections is increasing? The left, the middle, or the right? The left and the right. Because you're supposed to be going from left to right when you trace, right? So this is actually going up, 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 then flat, and then it jumps over here and goes up, 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 right? So I'm going to have two intervals. How do I tell the computer that both of them are part of my answer? Usually give me it. I don't know if it lets me type in a U or if I want to actually click on that other thing over there. I don't want that. That's not the one to do it. So what would be the interval I use for the left chunk? So there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really stop. There's no like dot, right? So just assume it's negative infinity. And then where does it go? Where does it stop? The left side. At zero. Good. That's the x value. And then where does the other section start? At two, and it goes to infinity. Does it ever decrease this function? No. As I'm looking at it from left to right, it never actually goes downward, right? So this one would be D and E. And then for the constant interval, what would that be? Just uh, zero. Uh-huh, zero to zero. Just make sure you're using the X's, right? And not the Y's. Don't use the Y's for these intervals. Okay, great. This one more. Oh, I want us to sketch it. So these you do have to draw on your paper. Try to draw them on your paper, and then you just take the graph that kind of looks like yours. 
Yours is probably not going to be nice and perfect like theirs, but you can tell which one is yours. Let me write it down. I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, we have their transformation, right? Now we do. So for me personally, I like to rewrite it. Let's talk about it. I like to leave that alone, right? That's the coefficient of this. So I have to leave the minus there. So then I put the plus one off to the side. Okay. And I'm going to use my transformations to graph both of these. Okay. Now there's another way I can do it, and I can show you both ways. I showed you one way before already, where you made a two table, right? You plug in certain numbers into that one, you plug in certain numbers into that one. But that was because that was before I learned about all the transformations. Okay. Now that I know about the transformations, I should be able to graph that pretty easily. At least have an idea of what it looks like. Okay, so I know that this is a squared function, right? So it's going to look like a parabola, but is it going to open upward or downward? Because of that A, right? That negative, it's going to go down like this, okay? I also know that instead of being at the origin and going downward like that, it's moving around somewhere. So if I put a minus in there, what does it do to the graph? It moves it in which direction? To the right. So this is going to have to go to the right one. Then it also has to do what? Go up one. So in a sketch, I'm actually over here, aren't I? And then going down, right? Okay, that's what this one looks like. Now, I want to know for when x is less than or equal to 2. Is it 2 over here somewhere? Right? I don't know where it is. What happens if I plug in two in here? What do you get? I know what I get. I get zero. Right? If I plug in two there, what's two minus one? One, right? If I square that one, what do I have? One. And then if I make it negative, it's now a negative one. But as soon as I add one to that negative one, it turns into zero, right? So that means I have a y value of zero when x is two. Now, I'm only supposed to have this graph when x is less than or equal to two. So I can have a solid dot there, but I do not need this part of the graph, do I? Because that would be when x is bigger than two, okay? This one looks like a, Kind of like a sideways parabola, but only half. It looks like that, right? <laughs> what happens to it when you have minus two there? When it's on the inside of the basic function, it does not go up or down. It goes to the right. So it's actually going to be over here going that way. But would it be a solid dot? No, because there's no bar here, right? So that would actually be an open dot. And I'm just going to draw that over there. Now, it would be an open dot, but what's the issue? It was already solid there, right? The solids will always override your, the holes. Okay, it's like it's a limit. So it is going to look solid right now. But now I know exactly what it looks like. Doesn't it look like, it, like somebody was hopping, right? <laughs> but I have an idea of what the graph would look like. And it does, looks like this one, doesn't it? Okay, so we've got that parabola on the left side and then the square root function on the right hand side. Okay. And I didn't need to do the chart or any of that jazz. Okay, I am going to do it again, but with the chart. Okay, just so if you got used to that, you can still do it that way. Okay, I'll do that in blue, but it's the same, the same business. Okay, so if I was going to use the chart method, I would have to do two charts because I have two functions, right? And it really wouldn't matter what form the function was in. I placed it to the original, it doesn't matter, okay? But I know I have to use the number two because it's over here. 
And because it has a bar, I know it would be a solid value, right? And then I have to pick x values that are less than two. So maybe one, if I good enough. And then it has a regular dot, okay? Then I'm also gonna need to use two over here, but this one is gonna have an open dot and I need to pick an x value bigger than two. So we'll choose three, okay? And that will have just a regular, a regular dot. Now, when I plug two into the top function, we already did that, didn't we get zero? When I plug one into there, this is gonna be zero squared. So what's one minus zero? Just one. And so then if I draw those, it's gonna be two and zero going this way with a solid dot. And then, or I'm sorry, two and zero with a solid dot, and then one and one with a, solid, with a regular dot. Not one of those dots, right? A regular dot. And then I know it's supposed to be a parabola, so you would kind of go like this. If you don't know if it's going to go back down here, plug in another number less than one. Okay. If I plug in zero there, I'm going to get negative one squared, which is one, one minus one, and then zero. And I have a regular dot there. Right. And then now you know it goes up, but then it actually comes back down. Over here, you plug in two, you get two minus two into zero, the square root of zero, zero. But it was already filled in right there, wasn't it? Right here. And then when I plug in three, I get three minus two, which is one. What's the square root of one? Just one. So then I have the point three and one, which is right there. And you know that that one's supposed to look like a little curve. And so you just draw those curves. So you do still need to know the basic shapes. I still need you to know that looks like a quadratic. So does it go back down or does it just keep going up forever, right? You do need to know an extra point because you know what that's supposed to look like. This one, you know what it's supposed to look like. So two points is good enough. Okay. So either way, whether you're using your transformations or if you're just using the charts, it can still be done, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so this one you do have to sketch. You're not going to have all these different parts to it. You're only going to probably be using one of them to do, um, but they still want us to work it out. So I think we need to. I don't want to quit on the test, but I think there's enough junk at the top of the test in order for me to show it to you without showing you the questions. This game is going to turn off. There it is. So I do it. <laughs> and then you see like the first two problems. Um, okay, yes, there is enough jazz on there. Okay. How far can I scroll down? Okay, good. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. I'm going to have to change something on here. Um, and I can change it. It's not that big. So this is all the stuff that you're going to have at the beginning of the test if you're doing it online. If you do it in face-to-face, -face, then you're going to have all of the, um, you're going to have a paper with all of this stuff on it. Okay, but I did see an error in here, so I'm going to have to fix it. My error is when I wrote this stuff down here at the bottom, that top one is not supposed to be called standard form. That one's supposed to be called general form. This one is the one that's supposed to be called standard form or vertex form, okay? And I don't want that to confuse anyone, so I have to change that when I go in there. I'll do it as soon as we get here. But I wanted to draw your attention to this chart up here for all the transformations, okay? You will have that chart, and it does help a lot, okay? So it tells you if you have a plus or a minus inside the function, right? It moves left or right. It tells you if you have plus or minus a number outside the function, it does this or that, right? 
<laughs> so I'm going to go back to our problem, and ours has a minus four on the inside of the map. So that means that all the points are going to go where? Right to the right four. Now, this is also what I like about this is because it tells me how to get the new points. Okay. It tells me if I have minus four over here, what am I going to do? I'm actually going to add that value to all of my x points. And that is what's going to make it move to the right, okay? And so what I do sometimes is I write all five of these points down. I do whatever I'm supposed to do to all of them. And then I just find the graph that matches all those new points, okay? So I'm gonna actually write that down. Instead of trying to draw the thing, because that's kind of a little much. Um, now I don't put that you have to show work on this problem, but if you wanted to, you could do what I'm doing. Because it is a visual problem, you should be able to find the graph and actually just slide it over to the right. Uh, how many units? Four units, right? So visually, I should be able to find the one that does that. Uh, I'm going to look at the peak. So the peak here at zero, it should be over there four now, right? And some of the peaks over there at four, this one didn't do anything. No, and wrong direction, right? <coughs> so it has to be that one. Now, this one's also not too bad. The plus one does what to the graph? It makes it flip over. No, it makes it go up one, right? So I know that instead of that little peak being at zero and five, it's actually going to go up to six, right? But what does that negative do? It flips it over. So instead of it being, um, it's actually going to be at negative four because you always have multiply first before you add, right? So we have to flip first before we shift. So if I take that positive five and I flip it down here to negative five and the whole thing turns into a U, right? But after I flip it over, I gotta shift it up one, right? So instead of being down at negative five, it's actually gonna shift up one, okay? So it'll be this graph here. These are the ones that are really gonna come in handy with you messing with the points, okay? So I'm gonna do number C. It has a one third in the front. Now notice when it has a number in the front, depends on what kind of number that is. But regardless of what kind of number it is, don't you just multiply all the y values by that number? So for that one, I have f one third f of x for part C. I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do to all the points to figure out what the new points are. So this is going to become negative six, and what's negative four times one third? You can use your calculator if you need to, but it is just negative four thirds, which is about negative 1.3. Then this one, what happens when I multiply zero by a third? Zero. It's still zero. When I multiply five times a third, it's just five thirds, which is uh, one in 1.6 or 1.7. Here again, when I multiply zero by a third, it stays a zero. And here, when I multiply this by a third, it turns into this. And so I'm looking for the graph with these five points. So let's see the graphs. Oh wait, I wrote a little bit back. Okay. So negative six and one point three. Negative one point three. So negative six and negative one point three should be like over here somewhere, right? It's only this graph that has that point. Negative six and negative one point three. This one have it? No, nope, that's positive, isn't it? And that one's positive. So it has to be that one. This one, the first point, right? It has to be that one. Okay. This one, same thing. You need to do your minus before you do the adding and subtracting. Okay. And actually, no, because don't you do what's in the parentheses first? Order of operation. Right, we do what in the parentheses first and then the multiplication. Okay, so we have to actually shift first and then we can. Why did I 
Um, shift it first. So which way is it going to shift if the, the plus five is on the inside? It goes left. So it's going to shift over here. And then the negative is going to do what to it? Flip it. So that's why it's going to be easy, right? Instead of looking like a, a little pivot. This one, only one thing is happening. Well, what happens when there's a minus on the inside? It reflects over the y axis. So only the x values are changing to the opposite signs. Well, look at the graph though, the original. If you change this guy's x value, that's going to turn into this point and vice versa. And when you change this guy's x value to positive, it turns into that point and vice versa. So it's going to look exactly the same. That's not it. This one is that five right here. Here, what is it doing? Down. So that looks look like it. Oh yeah, they do. Because it was at five, right? It's positive five. So if it went down six, it would be right here. Right? Okay. This one is another one of those weird ones. We might only need to do one or two points. It's got the number multiplied on the inside, doesn't it? And what does it say I'm supposed to do with that number over here? I'm supposed to take the x value and divide it by that number, okay? So I'm gonna go back over there, and what happens if I take my x values? What part of this? This is g. I'm just gonna do one point because I'm lazy and I <laughs> hopefully that'll be enough, right? <laughs> and I'll be able to figure it out. So I'm supposed to divide my x value by that. So I'm gonna do negative six divided by one third. And it actually turns into negative 18 if you put it in a calculator. Okay. You take a fraction, put negative six at the top of the fraction, and then put the one third at the bottom of the fraction, it will pop out negative 18. And so I'm just going to look for the graph that has that point, and hopefully there's not more than one, right? So negative 18, it looks like it's going to have to be this one, doesn't it? Right? So okay. It's just too wide that it didn't fit on this little 13 by 13 graph. Okay. Alrighty then, that's that one. So I didn't have to write too, too much on my paper, but this chart is going to come in handy a lot. Okay, when it comes to the transformation. So let's look at these because there's more transformation. It says use the graph of x squared to write the equation represented by this graph. What happened to the regular x squared? Regular x squared is supposed to have the vertex here, right? So it looks like it just moved down one. Yeah, it looks like it moved down one, right? So all that means is if it went down, what am I doing? I'm going to minus one, right? But on the inside or the outside? Outside. Outside. So it just looks like this, right? Okay. Now here, it's supposed to be here, and it's supposed to go that way. Well, one, it flipped, right? So I know I'm going to have a negative in the front. But then even if it flipped downward, it, the vertex should still be here. So what did it do to get all the way over there? It went to the left one, right? Which means it's actually going to be plus one on the inside. And then it went where else? Up two, which means it'll be plus two on the outside. Okay. Now they're giving us the cube. And this looks exactly like a regular cube. You also do have your basics on here, right? So you will know like where they're supposed to be originally, and then you have that transformation chart. So originally, this is it is in the right you know direction, but it should have been here. So what happened to it? It went up two. So I just have to do plus two on the outside. Okay. What happened to this one though? It did flip. Little thing's supposed to go up to the right, right? 
correct? <laughs> it went down. So I definitely know I have a negative in there. And it did go left. One, two, three. That little center part went to the left three. So I'm going to add three on the inside. And then what do I need to do on the outside? Right, because it also moved down, right? It's supposed to be on the y axis and it moved down below the y axis or x axis. So it was supposed to be here. After moving it, it was supposed to go there, but it went down. Now we're doing the absolute value. So what happened to this absolute value? It did flip. It's supposed to go up, right, originally? And then they flipped it. So now I have a negative outside the bars. Do I need to put anything inside the bars with it? Yes. And do I need to put anything outside the bars? It's still right there on the x axis, right? It did not go up or down. What about this one? Did it flip? So no negative. Do I need to put anything on the inside? It did go to the right three, so correct. It's going to be a minus three. Do I need to put anything on the outside? It went down, so we have to put minus four. I like you to plus all of them. <laughs> like every single one you can possibly get. <laughs> okay. Um, what happened here? Is this the right direction? The correct direction it's supposed to go in? Okay, so no negative needed, but it moved. So is there gonna be anything inside the square root? Uh, plus two. Um, yes, so it's gonna be x plus two, and then is there going to be anything outside the square root? It went down to minus eight. You got it. Now here for this one, if you just type in, notice how I did that right? S-Q-R-T, it automatically puts it on the Instead of having to go over there, the I don't know. I don't know how many times I've said it My daughter's like, you don't ever have holiday stuff. I was like, why would I? <laughs> Just go to somebody's house. <laughs> okay. Um, this one's weird. It is not facing the correct direction, the way it originally faced. Okay. And it actually flipped twice. Because if I take the original graph, this one here, it's not even on here, I need to add it in there. I can write a note so that I can remember to add it in there. Add square root. But it originally, I'll go Google it real quick. Um, square. Square root of graph. Okay, that's good. So it's supposed to look like this, right? But now all of a sudden it's facing that way and it's going like under, right? So it did flip over the x-axis to make it go under, right? But in order to make it go under and face the other side, it had to have flipped over the y-axis as well. So that puppy actually flipped over twice. It flipped over once over the x-axis and once over the y-axis. And we know when that happens, you have to put a double negative, a negative on the outside and a negative on the inside, okay? So for that one, we're gonna have a negative out here but also a negative in here. And this is where it's going to get confusing also. I'm going to do the outside first. So for the outside, they go up or down? So it went down, so it's going to be minus, and it looks like it went down five units. But it also went to the what? To the right, two units. So I'm going to have to actually enter minus two. But notice that when I did it, I had to put it in parentheses, okay? Because you're going to have to do the shift first, then do the reflection going this way. So basically, you have it that way. You'll move it over twice, but it's still going that way, right? Then that minus will actually flip it so that it goes under, but to the right. Then this minus on the outside will actually flip it so that it goes under, but to the left. 
and then finally you can go down five from there to here. Okay, but you have to follow your order of operations. This first, then this, then that, and then finally the add the five. Okay. I have to put those parentheses in there. If I don't, it won't match the graph. Okay. I hate the negative on the inside. It makes me sick. I don't think that the bullet has to go. Okay. So now we're getting into our combinations, right? Where we're gonna like add things together, multiply them together, do whatever they say to with these guys. Okay. So for 27, I have two functions. And they're asking me to do f plus g of seven. For these, you do have to write something. And I just wanted to show you that I do tell you like what to do, right? And then we can put stuff about the domains, okay? In case they ask you about the domains. Normally they only ever ask you when it comes to division. But you never know. So for this one, it's just plugging in a number. So when you plug in numbers, it's actually easier than when you do it just with the variables. Well, I don't know. But this means f of seven plus g of seven. And so you could do side work and go figure out what f of seven is, go figure out what g of seven is, and then just put the results here. I like to do it all in the same line, just so it flows and you see where everything came from. Okay. So I like to use big brackets there and big brackets there to do all the side work in the problem. Okay. Just not really on the side anymore. So plug seven into that function, it looks like this. Plug seven into that function, and it looks like this. It looks like that, right? And so I'm just going to figure this out. That's actually a 10. And this is actually 49 minus 2 is 47. And then we can finally add them together. What do you get? It's 57, right? Well, not too bad. See what 28 looks like. This one has the same functions, but now they're asking me for f, g, and negative 6. So I'm going to go to my chart over here, and when it has f, g, it just means the f function times the g function with the same number. So that means f of negative six times g of negative six. So for me, I like to put that in there, put the times, and then put that in there. So I'm gonna plug in negative six into the f function, and I'm gonna plug in negative six into the g function. For the f function, I get negative three, and for the g function, I get 34. Does that look right so far? Doesn't let me know. And so I get negative one or two. The numbers can be fake, so don't freak out if you get something out if they can come out large. Okay. Okay. Do the computation and whatever it is. So then now number 29, this is different functions. Here, I think they want us to do all of them. This will probably be more. You probably will have one where you have to plug in a number just that I know that you know how to do it when it has numbers. Um, but I think you're definitely going to have one like this. I don't know what the functions are going to look like. Um, but you definitely will have one where it asks you to do all the pieces. Okay. Um, and it will also ask you for the week. Now, these only ask the domain of f over g. I can't promise that that's the same on the test. The test may ask you for the domain of the other three. Okay, right? The times from add and subtract. But we already know that we kind of have to figure that out first before we can figure out the f over g anyway, right? So you will be able to do that all by yourself. Um, and let's go see what this one's going to like. So f plus g. Let's go over to my graph. So that just means I'm going to take this plus this. 
And if I were to write that f function plus the g function in the computer or in the lesson when we were learning that, they always said put these in parentheses and then you can decide later if you need them. There's no exponent or coefficient here that has to be applied. So I don't need that first set of parentheses. And here there's no exponent, but there is a coefficient to apply, right? What's positive one times a radical? It's still just a positive radical, isn't it? But none of these things are like terms. You have three terms here. You have the x squared, the three, and then this radical. The radical is not the same as a constant or an x squared. So you cannot do anything with that. It's just going to stay like that. So let the answer to have that for f plus g. Okay. Now for f minus g, it's very similar. Again, you would want to put these guys in their parentheses, especially if this were more than just one radical. There's nothing to do for that first parenthesis. And if I multiply this by a negative, I just get minus square root of seven minus x. Again, none of them are like terms, so you cannot do anything with that. For this one, it's you definitely need the parentheses, but it's x squared plus three times the square root of seven minus x. You could distribute, right? Because you have one term times two terms. So you could write x squared, 7 minus x, and then plus 3, 7 minus x. But these are not like terms. They do match the radicals, right? But the front numbers, the coefficients, also have to match. And this coefficient is a constant, and this coefficient is x squared. So these are not like terms. They almost were, but not quite. So leave them alone after you distribute. And then the f over g, that was usually the nice one because you don't have to do anything to it. You just put the f on the top and the g on the bottom. There's really not much else you can ever do with those. So that's just it. That's the answer. But it does ask me for the domain of f over g. And to do that, I actually have to figure out the other guy's domains first. Because these guys' domains are the domain of f intersected with the domain of g. And the domain of f over g is that same domain, but take away any numbers that make g equal to zero. Okay? I'm literally writing what was on no g. Okay? So what is the domain of f? Look at f. What kind of function is it? What's the domain of quadratics? All, all real numbers. This is the way you write all real numbers in an interval, right? Everything. Negative infinity to positive infinity. Domain of G, though, is not all real numbers. Because it's got that even radical, right? So let's double check. You would have to do 7 minus x greater than or equal to 0. So if I minus 7 over, I get this. And if I divide by a negative 1, I get that. But if I divide it by negative one, what happens to the symbol? It flips. So you actually have this, which means my interval over here is actually negative infinity to seven, right? This um, intersect symbol means what do the two sets have in common? This one has everything to the right, but this one doesn't. It stops on the right, doesn't it? It stops at seven. So anything beyond seven, they are not going to have in common, are they? So you just go with the smaller of the two sets. It has to be this. This is what they have in common. It's just this one has more, right? So then now I know for the domain of f over g, it's going to be negative infinity to seven, but I'm going to have to take out somebody. I just don't know who that somebody is, okay? How do we get it? We take g equal to zero. So you take g, the whole g function, and set it equal to zero. How do I solve this for x? First thing I'm going to do is get rid of that square root, right? So I'm going to square both sides. 
And then I end up with seven minus X equals to still zero. And then just because I'm running out of space here, I'm actually going to add X. I never do that, but I'm going to do it today because that helps me get to the answer faster, right? Then minus into seven and then five by negative. So I get that X equals seven. So I have to remove the seven. How do I write that as an interval? It is this interval, but I have to take out the number seven. It will just turn that bracket into a parenthesis. Now there's not a solid dot at seven, right? That was a hole at seven. So this is the one we were looking for. If on the test it asks you for one of these guys' domains, or if it asks you for all of these guys' domains, you already did it, didn't you? You already have it. Okay. So you shouldn't, you have to do that in order to get the other one. So if you could do the harder one, you should be able to do the easier one, right? Okay, I think we have one more. I don't know if we have enough time. Yeah, we do have time. Try to do it. Okay. I'm surprised we got through the whole thing. It's because there was a lot of them that we could just look at. And it is the same on the actual. This one down. That says B in the name of F over G. Okay, so here we go. We got this one. It's the same function with the computer. So if I add them, I'm going to have x over x plus 7 plus x cubed. You could try and make them have a common denominator and put it all together, but it never asks you to do all of that. So if this is one of the choices, then you're done. Okay, and it probably will be the sort of functions that you were given. Even if I do minus, I have this fraction here, minus this one term. Can't do anything with it, just leave it alone. For the multiplication though, this one is different. You're gonna multiply by the x cube. That you can do. You can just simply put this over one, right? Like a fraction. And it's always top times top, bottom times bottom. So x times x cubed would give me x to the fourth, but one times the bottom keeps the bottom the same. But you can't do anything else with that one, so that one is good. This one, I'm gonna put x on the top, and then at the bottom, I'm gonna put x cubed. This one you cannot leave like that. This is what's called a complex fraction. If they have fractions, it's like fractions. You can't leave them like that. You have to multiply by the common denominator. So I know that this guy's denominator is one. So between that denominator and that denominator, the common denominator is x plus seven, right? So I'm going to multiply this by x plus seven, and I'm multiplying this by x plus seven. I am literally multiplying by x plus seven over x plus seven. That's the same as multiplying by a really weird looking one. So I'm not changing the value of anything, okay? Just manipulating it. So for here, the x plus seven will cancel. And I'll have x all by itself at the top. And here, nothing cancels. So I have both the x cubed and the x plus seven down here. You can leave it like that. If there are multiple choices, the multiple choices will leave it like that, okay? Do not need to. Distribute the x cube. Not that that's wrong, but you don't have to. Here's the hard part with this with this function. The hard part is going to be that domain stuff. 
So I do first need to figure out the domain of the other three, and that is by doing the intersection of the two function domains. So looking at f, the, what is the domain of that function? That is a fraction, is it not? And we know that our denominators cannot equal zero, right? So that means that that x plus seven cannot equal zero, which means x cannot equal negative seven. So the domain of f is actually going to be negative infinity to negative seven, and then negative seven to infinity. Everything except the negative seven. The whole thing is the domain of f. This and this together. What is the domain of g? G is what function? I know you can't see this way. There. G is just x cubed, right? That's just the polynomial. So its domain should be negative infinity to infinity. And when you ever have to combine negative infinity to infinity with another interval, you always choose the smaller interval, right? This one is smaller. It's the same thing as this. It just has one guy taken out, right? This is the smaller interval. I know it's both small, but it's the smaller. It's the interval that has less numbers in it, okay? So we're actually gonna go with this as our combined uh, domain, okay? Now we have to start with that in order to find this guy because this guy is that domain, but then we still have to take out where g is equal to zero, right? So I do have that domain. I just need to know what the heck am I taking out, right? So let's go look at g equal to zero. That would mean x cubed equal zero. Well, I could take the cube root of both sides, and then I could get x equals zero. So I need to take this interval and take out the zero. Does zero live over here? These are all negative, right? So zero is not over there. Is zero over here? It's. So this one's good. I don't have to take anything out of there. The other one is not good. There's a zero in the middle there somewhere, right? Probably closer to the left side, but. There's a zero in there. So you got to take that zero out, which means you're going to have from negative seven to zero, and the zero is not included anymore, right? And then you got to pick up on the other side of zero and still go all the way to infinity. If it helps you, and it does help me, I like to draw. I like to take the negative infinity to infinity I already know there's a hole there because x cannot equal negative seven. And now we're telling you that you have to take out zero as well. So then now there's no zero either, right? And you can see the three different chunks as you're, as you're doing, okay? Which are these three different chunks. You can draw it or you can just it. Okay, I think that is it for our review. So the problems are gonna be very similar to this. It might be in different orders, but for the most part, it is everything there. Okay, there's no weird curveball like there was on that one test. Um, it's all very straightforward. Okay. So please, please, please study this review, and then we will test on Monday. So I hope you guys have a good weekend.